All right, I think we are live. I decided to do this as a Facebook Live comparative recently, so I don't know if anybody's going to chime in. Um, but uh, Facebook gives me a nice option to uh, download the video when I'm done, so I can upload it on YouTube. The reason why I'm doing this here, and I'm not home, I'm visiting somebody, is that uh, like with any like with any class that I take, I try to sit in front of the camera and talk through my impressions and most importantly from uh, talk through my lessons learned uh, as early as I can before uh, before the memories fade and then later on when I rewatch the video I remember more stuff right so this video it's probably not gonna be very long 20 30 minutes at most maybe less hopefully less uh, this will uh, uh, this will help me trigger my memories later. Uh, if you are trying to read my t-shirt and it looks weird, well, uh, I'm using uh, Facebook's uh, front-facing camera, which inverts the image, and I haven't figured out how to, uh, how to invert it back. I might, uh, I might uh, uh, try later in post-processing, but basically it says my people skills are just fine, it's my tolerance of idiots that needs work. Um, just being honest, really. Anyhow, so for a little bit of a, uh, for a little bit of a background, I am not a very good shot. I talk a lot about guns, I spend a lot of time at the shooting range, but I started shooting fairly late. I started shooting uh, when I was uh, 19 years old and uh, for the first several years I really didn't get any training and I really started getting real training comparatively late, right? So um, maybe reflection of hubris or arrogance or something. It's hard to say. But anyhow, um, I had a lot of bad habits to unlearn and I've been unlearning them and I am uh, slowly but surely getting better. And uh, when I started going to front side a few years ago, uh, that's been very helpful for me. Um, front sight, uh, it's a shooting school in Parump, Nevada, not far from Las Vegas. It's an occasionally controversial place. Some people like it, some people dislike it. Uh, their marketing is a little kooky. I'll be honest with you, but the training has been good. Is it the best out there? Who knows? But uh, it is easy for me to make it there. It is easy for me to bring my friends there. I have a membership, so I don't have to pay extra for classes, pay for ammo, that sort of stuff. I don't know how their business model works, but the instructors are competent, uh, they're friendly, they're nice. Is it as good as going, taking a, a class with some special forces operator, whatever else? Maybe not, but you know, they've got recon marines and other generally competent people. So I uh, enjoy it and I always, uh, I always learn something. And the nice thing is that every time I go there, the instructors encourage you to go and learn from somebody else at other shooting schools, places around. And when we come to a class in France, they say, look, if you guys know how to do something better than we do, please tell us. We will consider it. So they do maintain an open mind, and I always, I, I always enjoy that. Anyhow, so once a year, on the 4th of July weekend, they offer several night shooting classes. They start right around 6.30 p.m. and go until a bit after midnight. Um, there are good reasons for that. The best one is that uh, uh, in July, in the desert, it's a little bit warm, just a little bit. It's a little bit like a furnace plus a few degrees. Uh, but at night it's very nice and it's a nice opportunity to use flashlights and it's something that we don't do a lot I've done a lot of shooting and uh, using a lot of um, observation using optics at night I haven't done a whole lot of shooting at night uh, that was done uh, haven't, who do I have there T is watching hey T, how are you buddy but anyhow, so I haven't done all that much shooting at night under time pressure. And that is an entirely different, entirely different ballgame. As I said, I'm not a particularly good shot, but I'm a world-class gearhead. 
So what I do, and I, the only reason I was able to go and take this class is that uh, I convinced uh, my wife and the kids to uh, go on vacation for three weeks while I'm ostensibly working and you know we're moving so there's a lot of things to do but in the meantime I was home alone on 4th of July so I managed to find a way to go take this class and during the day I can still work so I go and take this class and I outfit three uh, different rifles for it because one of the things I want to understand is what works in low light, what doesn't, what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages if you have to go fast, because I'm not good at going fast. Going fast is not very natural for me. I'm a deliberate guy, I'm a precision-oriented guy. So the whole fast thing for me is a little bit uh, uh, unnatural. And I always want to know what gear uh, works. And another thing to keep in mind is that I'm really good at learning things. So a lot of things I get from France that I can go and practice on my own as situation and environment uh, permits. So I had three rifles with me. Um, they're here. I'm going to show you what they are. You can see them in the background and I'll explain uh, what's what. They are unloaded. There are no magazines anywhere in this room. There's no ammo anywhere in this room. The actions are the actions are open, there's nothing in there, and the same for all of the rifles. So um, all three are 556 carbines with 16 inch barrels. This one is mostly a Crimson Trace affair. Crimson Trace started making optics this year and I've been kind of looking at them and I generally like what I see. This is the 3.5 power battle sight, it's a 3.5 power prism scope. I have in an offset mount at a 45 degree mount a Hawk micro dot. I have two of them. There's a specific thing I wanted to explore with the Hawk and I'll touch on that later because one has a 3 MOA dot, another one has a 5 MOA dot. I also have a Crimson Trace flashlight here with the remote uh, uh, pressure switch. Okay. Um, Brigand Arms uh, handguard, ultralight stock, the barrel is from AR-15 Performance, I quite like it. All my rifles I, I build myself out of pieces. All right, this one is another 556, action open. This is a Crimson Trace rifle style uh, red dot called CTS 1400, not magnified. I do have uh, backup iron sights on this gun and I've tried using it with both iron sights and a red dot. The flashlight here is very different. It's a WML Gen 2 from Inforce. And the way this works, there's no pressure switch, but there's this angled switch on the back that can go permanent. Uh, is it off? Yeah, I turned it off. That can go permanent on, uh, like this, like this. Okay, so it works fairly well, but the action of pressing the switch is different and as I learned, this kind of stuff plays certain tricks on your guy handling, gun handling. Yes, high, high T. Third rifle was, uh, well, some problems, I'll tell you later. This is the full day upper on one of my lowers. Alcan uh, 4 power uh, prism scope, that's my primary AR scope and another Hawk micro dot on top. This Hawk has a 5 MOA dot, the other one has a 3 MOA dot. The flashlight is from Streamlight. This is their Protac HLX. It's, I think, a thousand lumens, something like that. Um, also pressure switch. Um, nice flashlight, well regarded. The standard presumably is Surefire. Surefire is very expensive. And I was curious uh, to experiment with uh, other lights. So this one is about a thousand lumens, I think 900. The Crimson Trace is about eight to nine hundred also. And the uh, and the Inforce is 400. In this class, the shooting happens, most of the shooting happens within seven and fifty yards. But we did shoot at 100 and we did shoot at 200. And we did shoot briefly at 400. But with a flashlight, it's from 100 yards and in. And uh, the first thing in terms of flashlight powers, 400 lumen was sufficient for me at 50 yards and in. It was a K at 100. If I'm going beyond 50 yards, I generally want a brighter flashlight. Okay, so, uh, uh, so there's that. Now, in terms of lessons learned, 
So uh, before I go into lessons learned, uh, did anything break? Uh, it is a four-day class, so I spent the different days with different rifles. Uh, the f none of my flashlights uh, break. One of the straps that holds the pressure switch for the Crimson Trace flashlight did break, but it has an adhesive pad, so nothing moved. I think it's there. I you know I bumped it against something, so it broke. And it didn't affect me in the slightest. And uh, uh, this, all the sights worked fine. My full day R somehow on the third day decided that it's a single shot. I did not spend uh, any time trying to figure out what's wrong with it. Uh, it was working fine earlier. I cleaned everything. I'm going to make it to the range and see and see what's happening with this thing. Uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. As far as gun handling goes, so this is sort of an interesting thing. I hold my rifle a little bit differently than a lot of people who go fast do. And what I found uh, works for me, you know, people right now, the fashionable thing, people go, you know, the C-clamp and stuff. It doesn't seem to work for me all that great. Partly because I do the same thing for slow fire, for fast fire and for shotgun. So I like to support it on the bottom. So where pressure switch is makes a big difference for me. Um, pressure switch on top didn't work great. Pressure switch a little bit to the side, did. that makes it less ambidextrous. So it is what it is. I'm still right-handed, so that's okay. What I found is that, so I train shooting offhand a fair bit, and uh, I thought I had it all nicely grooved in. The way frontside classes work from 50 yards and in, everything is shot standing at 100 yards. They give you an option. You can use any position of your choice. I still go standing, right? Because I want to learn to shoot standing better, especially at the 100, but at other distances as well. The simple action of other than supporting the rifle, you know, pulling it a little bit back in your, into, in, a little bit back into your shoulder. Once I add one simple thing to it, pressing on the uh, switch of the flashlight, all of a sudden, my position becomes less stable because it somehow screws up with my uh, screws up my isometric tension. Right? Never occurred to me that it would. I mean, did I grab it? My hand naturally there. I don't have to shift my hand. Nope. Screwed me up. Made me less accurate. Took me four days to figure out how to shoot with this thing. By day four, I kind of started getting more stable again. It's not rocket science, but it's one of those things. It's not just know your equipment. Be familiar with your equipment practice with your equipment, right? On top of it, so I've got uh, two flashlights with pressure switches, and I've got this inside WMS, which is an angled switch in the back. In principle, you're supposed to be pressing in, but in practice, you end up pressing forward just a little bit. So because you're pressing the button in a slightly different uh, direction, that screwed me up differently than a pressure switch does. Um, I think I can train this out, but it was a little bit of a uh, rude awakening, right? I'm trying to make um, hits from 100 yards uh, offhand, you know, the regular offhand stands, not target standing. Something that I you know, practice and generally can do adequately well, and all of a sudden I'm all over the place. It's not like I'm trying to make headshots, I'm doing center mass hits on a cardiothoracic cavity and missing, missing shots that I'm not supposed to miss. So I am going to, you know, next time I go practice, I'm going to have a flashlight on my gun. And I'm going to practice with both a pressure switch and a, and a uh, flashlight with the integrated switch and, uh, uh, and see how it works. Then there is the uh, question of magnified optic versus a red dot sight only. If you, it depends what you want to do. For target identification, a little bit of magnification clearly helps. And then low light using ambient light. We did try to do some shooting using ambient light as the light was fading. In ambient light, it is absolutely clear that a little bit of magnification helps, right? So it doesn't help you at seven yards and you don't see any other stuff at seven yards. Um, Three and a half power on the Crimson Trace scope, or four power on the Alcan. Uh, both worked fine. Both helped me see the details of the target better. Right? If I have to look at 
someone in the dark and figure out if this is a bad guy or not. I, I you know, need to make a decision before you shoot. It's not just, you know, pick up a gun and blast, right? If I have to figure this out, a little bit of magnification really helps, and it really helps as you get older, right? So my eyes, uh, I have pretty decent night vision, but my eyes don't dilate as quickly as they used to, and if you're pulsating a flashlight, doing other things, you screw up your night vision a little bit. A little bit of magnification goes a long way. But if you're going to be shooting magnified, you need to think a little bit about your flashlight, because what happens now is that if you're using a magnified optic, it's a larger collection aperture than your eye, right? There's a front objective of the scope, what's it? 30, 32 millimeters on the ones I used. And um, it will blind you more, because the reflected light from whatever you've just illuminated, bouncing on a scope, you're getting more light to your shooting eye. So depending on the distances involved, if you're running a magnified optic of any sort, well, maybe you don't, maybe you want to consider uh, a flashlight that's not super hot, not super narrow. Maybe you'll have a high lumen flashlight, but something that can be adjusted to wider angle, something like that, right? It's just uh, uh, something to consider. But one of the exercises we did was uh, when the instructor was using his flashlight to we have, you know, there is a lineup of people. We had 12 people on the days three and four. Uh, we started out with 30 something, but they left at the first two days, and uh, days three and four were just a couple of people. A couple, excuse me, about a dozen people. So we have a, a lineup of targets. The instructor has his handheld flashlight, he moves it around. And the idea is that when you see the target clearly, a double tap it. Well, I had a rifle in my hands that had both a magnified and non magnified optic. And I got to say, being able to quickly identify what's happening and see if it's worth shooting was much, much easier with a magnified optic. But non-magnified was uh, clearly quicker for shooting of hand, right? So pick your poison, right? What's happening there? Okay. So uh, pick your poison, decide what works for you. Now, I tried different ways of adding a red dot sight to a magnified optic, right? So on the uh, Crimson Trace, I had this sitting at about 45, 60 degrees, right? So when you're looking through a magnified optic, you go like this, and go like this to a red dot sight. During the day, this works quite well for me. During the night, well, it was a little bit less natural, partly because, uh, so it's peach, when middle of the desert, it's pitch black. Uh, the only uh, ambient light you've got is stars, right? So there are, you know, there are targets over there that you're supposed to shoot. You're not really sure where yours is, right? So when they go, when, they, when the beep goes off and you have some couple of seconds to make your hits, right? You need to get the gun up, turn the flashlight, figure out where your target is, adjust your rifle, to that target, and then go boom. It wasn't hugely comfortable for me with the 45 degree offset sight. And I shoot with that um, a fair bit. Okay, so that's uh, something to uh, uh, that's something to consider. But it wasn't uh, it wasn't too bad. Uh, with a red dot sight in a regular position, that was ultimately the fastest, especially at closer distances. Uh, between the 45 degree offset sight and a, and a piggyback uh, sight like I've got on the Alcan, I honestly, I honestly don't know which one I like more. Um, because uh, with a, with the piggyback sight, right? So you have your normal cheek, cheek weld to use magnified optic and chin weld to use the red dot. Um, it's a different presentation, and uh, a 45 degree offset red dot is also a different presentation, and I really don't know which one I like more. It's kind of tough. One that worked surprisingly well for me, that was with the Elcan, is a basically an equivalent of being the naming concept. Elcan can be set to illuminate just the center portion of the reticle and make it quite bright. And when I'm moving and transitioning with both eyes open, I can get on target very fast. And when I uh, stop moving, kind of uh, zoom in, and I've got my magnification that helps me identify the target, uh, helps me with the headshot, uh, that kind of stuff. So that 
um, that was interesting yeah that was worthwhile ultimately i think all of these methods uh, work just fine uh, but you have to train and i have a suspicion that as far as presentation goes i need to pick one and train if i trained more i could probably adjust a couple different methods and i think i can switch between them adequately well but initially after this experience i'm gonna pick one and train and i don't yet know which one uh, i'm going to pick as far as optical quality well the crimson trace performed very well it's half the price of the alcan i'm very pleasantly uh, surprised by this scope it uh, worked nice illumination was good reticle was reasonable it didn't lose zero so i'm quite happy with it uh, i really really liked the crimson trace red dot that's the cts uh, 1400 really impressed with this thing I um, think I'm gonna keep using this thing for a while it's a really nicely collimated dot there's a little bit of a color cast through it it's a little bit of a like greenish thing to me uh, the color the view through it looks a little bit like the vortex uh, razor red dot and it's also made in Japan I don't know if it's made by same OEM by, by different people it works similarly I really liked it the dot was bright when I needed to it was well defined uh, one of the things uh, about red dots is that a lot of us have uh, astigmatism of uh, some sort, right? What is not commonly understood is that if you have astigmatism, it will get worse at night. Astigmatism is effectively uh, some irregularities in the shape of your eye. And at night, when your eye pupil mm, dilates, the efficiency of the optic in your eye, of the lens in your eye, sort of goes down and the larger your eye pupil the more significant the astigmatism is and that is one of the things i was uh, trying to see with the hawk micro dots that i used but i really like these things they're little they're small they're reliable i had them on handguns and carbons i'm really happy with these things so the hawk micro dots i have one has three moa dot another one has a five moa dot so i ran both and during the day both of them not, so i have slight astigmatism right so the dot does not look perfectly round to me it's a little bit like a star but it's you know good enough for me to shoot inside of 100 yards i don't but in the dark when my eyes are dark adapted and fully dilated what used to look like a slightly fuzzy star during the day now looks like an elongated weird ass thingy and aiming with it at longer distances is not nearly straightforward because i don't know which part of the dot i should be aiming for that right so if the dot is a nice round circle or something starry and blurry you know center mass i can still aim with it but if the dot has a uh, a weird shape of some sort now that's a different ball game in practical terms so i tried aiming with different portions of the dot and all that instead of 25 yards it made no difference but i'm uh, going out to 50 if i aimed with the wrong part of this elongated target aiming structure whatever it is i could have problems the larger red dot on the, on the crimson trace this thing that did not give me the same problems ex specifically because it is larger right so the longer the red dot site is generally the better of a collimation quality you're gonna get this also depends on the shape of uh, uh, of the lens here whether it's spherical or aspherical or anything else so not all red dot sites are created equal and this crimson trace cts 1400 has performed really really well for me and the shape of the dot uh, stayed reasonably consistent even as my eye uh, dilated and that was kind of nice so that you understand the difference so this is the hawk micro dot which is nice kind of tiny comparatively speaking and this is the crimson trace the length of the site uh, makes a significant difference in the quality of the collimation okay but this is um, another reason why in the grand scheme of things and you know with me not really being a high speed uh, low drag kind of guy in the grand scheme of things <clears throat> my general purpose ar will continue wearing a, a magnified optic i'm gonna go take uh, the same class more or less uh, during the day in november and i'm gonna have uh, 
probably going to take either uh, the alcan or i'm going to take a low range variable and uh, and play with that so we'll see uh, we'll see how that goes but uh, i to me as the light gets low a red dot is really a 75 yards and in uh, proposition partly because as the dot gets more misshapen uh, I may have problems it's gonna be alleviated with better red dots right I can um, shoot more accurately from longer distance with a larger dedicated rifle crimson trace a red dot than I can with a small uh, hawk red dots Right. Um, there are other full-size red dots over there that provide better collimation quality, but by, as you get into that size range, I don't know if I want a red dot, right? If I'm putting up with something that big and bulky, maybe I want something else. Uh, my basic take on this is the, with red dots, I like smallish sides, so the crimson trace is about as big as I want to go with the red dot, right? This thing. If I'm going to go bigger, I have a uh, Vortex uh, AMG UH-1 holographic sight. It's a little bit heavier, a little bit bigger. Uh, it plays with my astigmatism a little bit better. Next time I do a night shoot, I'll probably do it with that. So if I'm going bigger than something the size of this uh, CTS 1400 Crimson Trace, I'm going to go with a holographic sight, either Vortex or uh, EOTAC. I like them both. They're good, good sights. If I'm going bigger than that, it's going to be a magnified optic, either a low range variable or a prism scope. The big question is that going forward, do I want uh, to have uh, some sort of a, a piggyback or offset red dot with a prism scope? And that is not clear to me because the way my eyes are, my binocular vision is quite good. And the the naming concept works pretty well for me, even in a fairly low light. So I've got some decisions. Uh, I've got some decisions to make there. Okay. So I think um, that's the bulk of my takeaways. You know, you need to know your equipment. Um, all the stuff you can compensate for in good light because you can see things in low light when you can't see shit. It all comes down to knowing your equipment. You have to do all the safety checks, all the malfunction clearances, all that sort of stuff. Uh, completely by touch and that was uh, I did okay there but that was a little bit different but all the controls and all the uh, buttons and all those things they uh, they have to be absolutely tactile that's one thing where Elkan definitely was better so on the Crimson Trace battle site um, the buttons that control illumination are here. Uh, they are tactile, you can feel them with your hand, but I don't know if I would feel them, would be able to feel them well uh, in uh, uh, with gloves. On the Alcan, this is sort of the reason, one of the reasons why this has been my go-to site for so many years, it's all one rotary control, right? And if I want illumination, if I go this way, I get the bright center crosshair, and if I go this way, the whole reticle with the BDC and everything is faintly illuminated and great for, uh, you know, precision shooting in low light. And optically, this thing is absolutely super. But you know, it's what, twelve, thirteen hundred bucks, something like that. Crimson Trace five hundred. If you ask me which one is a better bang for the buck, uh, uh, Crimson Trace. If you ask me which one is a better weapon sight, yeah, that's LK. Uh Same with flashlights. Figure out what you like. Practice with it. Uh, when I uh, got there, all three of my flashlights were not set up quite right. It all seemed okay for me when I was messing with it in good light. In low light, your hold changes, you have to press on this thing, everything changes. All of my flashlights, everything was set up too far forward. I had to move everything a little bit back so that could be a little bit more uh, compact because I need to move with this thing and I don't know where the target is until the flashlight is on. Uh, somehow it was all easier for me when I had the controls a little bit closer to the receiver. This whole business with your straight arm, all this sort of stuff, that didn't work well for me at night at all. In general, I'm probably going to give up on that. I can shoot that way fairly quickly and fairly accurately. But um, it doesn't transition well to shotgun for me. I shoot with a pump shotgun, not a semi-auto. So because I need to use the pump, 
it's easier for me to come in from below so i think i'll just stick with that grip it may not be optimal for speed but um, i like the idea of having a consistent grip and another thing so next time i do this night class I'm, i'll try to do it with a shotgun uh, because there is an added dimension right not only do i have to cycle it, this bloody thing i still i also have to work uh, the light switch somehow i'll need to do some experimentation but then i'll go to class and i will uh, uh, pick their brains but anyhow so i think that's it if you have any questions uh, ask them now if you don't i'm gonna wrap this up i'll download the video and i'll upload this to youtube so it will be there to see and uh, uh, T, you're a bench. Thank you for chiming in. Uh, I think that's a wrap. Thank you.